This week on Erudite Magic, I am thrilled to bring you by your request an interview with Harapan Ong. In this behind the scenes discussion, Harapan shares with us some stories that he's never told before about the origins of Principia. He also gives us a really great imitation of Joshua J and shares his creative process. You're not going to want to miss this, so let's get right into it. Hey everyone, I'm Harapan. I'm from Singapore. Uh, I'm very flattered to know that, you know, all the followers from Erudite Magic want to talk to me about magic book and magic in general. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to spend some time with Jeff to talk about this. Awesome. And uh, you'll see that I, I have your book out here, Principia. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank you absolutely. very much. It's a, it's a great, great book. And, Thank you very much. And actually, I wanted to start the discussion with sure. that a little bit and mm -hmm. talk about, I, for, for your background, I know that most people know that you're not a full-time professional magician, but maybe tell That's them just right. a little bit about what you do, and then we'll get into kind of how that led into you writing this book. Sure. So I, I've never been a professional magician in my entire life. It's never been something I earned my living from. Uh, I've always been a hobbyist, an amateur, a non-professional, whatever you call it. I just like doing magic for friends, family, and I love inventing tricks. Uh, my day job is I'm a high school physics teacher. I teach 17, 18 year old uh, physics in school to prepare them for the exams. And uh, when I'm not doing that, when I'm back at home, I'm pretty much always doing or thinking about something magic related. So that's pretty much. Um, so it seemed very natural that when I wanted to write a big book, and that was my goal. I wanted to write a big collection of all my magic in one book. I've always had the idea that I wanted it to be themed around physics and science, which is something I'm very interested in. And so that's where Principia came from. Principia is the name of uh, Isaac Newton's most famous book, books on the laws of motion, of gravitation, and all that. So Principia is uh, Latin for principles. It is, like I said, it's a tribute to Isaac Newton, probably the father of modern physics. And the book has been a huge hit. I'm very, I'm very, very proud of the book. How yeah. many languages is it in now? So currently it's in English, it is in uh, French. It, we, the most recent one was French. It's in Spanish. It is in Japanese. It is in Chinese, both the traditional Chinese and the simplified Chinese. So the simplified Chinese were the mainland Chinese people. And if you live in Taiwan, for example, uh, you, you would use the traditional Chinese version. So those are the all the different languages right now. That's it, awesome. It covers a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I In fact, one of my viewers just commented on the fact that it is in French and very excited for his French colleagues to pick it up. He had the English version from uh, when it was originally published, but he's very excited that mm -hmm. his friends who maybe don't read the English books will be able to participate in it. Yeah, so, it, it, it's been crazy on how, sorry, it just it's okay. crazy how many languages are, you know, so, so, so many. The, the thing is, once the book came out within like the first month or so, people were already trying to contact me to translate the book because usually my understanding is that books don't don't get this instant uh, demand for translations. Usually it takes a year or two before right. people realize, oh, this book is good. I want to translate it. But this was like on the get-go, people were really into translating. So I was very, very flattered by that. This episode is sponsored by Don's Magic and Books, who is offering you 10% off this week if you use the code ONG at checkout. Don has tons of awesome books, including Harapan's book, Principia, which you can get for just $54 shipped in the United States if you use that code this week. Don offers a ton of other great titles, both used and new, so feel free to shop around and find some deals that are to your liking. Of course, Don offers that refund of your shipping costs if you purchase $20 or more of media items in the United States, and if you're purchasing internationally, you can use shipit2.com to figure out how much shipping will cost to you. Don't forget, if you do purchase Harapan's book from Don, you will get the gimmicked packet of cards to go with that if you purchase it new, so you'll be ready to rock and roll with everything that he has to offer. Don't forget to check out the links down in the description below and start saving this week with code ONG. Back to the review. What made you think, I know you said you wanted to write a big book, but what made you think that you you could write a book of magic, right? I, I know that it's something that's crossed some people's minds and I want them to, to hear from someone who's done it successfully. What what gave you the drive and the desire to do that? Sure. Uh, a, a few things. Uh, I always keep a, a notebook for myself on, uh, a note for myself on all the tricks I've come up with. Uh, I write down the names and ideas I have come up with. And I know that- I actually have, have a video on that about keeping a notebook of, of your ideas and, and that's awesome to know that uh, you use that. 
I think I've lost my. Oh, oh no, it's over here. It's over here. Currently, I'm using a. I, I don't. I don't use a big one. Anymore. I just use small nucleus term. Um. Yeah, it's very important to keep track of what you've come up with, especially if you are creative. Because if you don't write it down, I've, I've forgotten so many things. Uh. So I kind of know that in terms of the quantity, I have it. And also another motivating factor for Spring KPS, not my first book. The first book is actually Close Calls. And at that time, because of that book, many people kept approaching me to go like, oh, Harpan, oh, you're the call guy. You, yeah. Oh, you, you do the call. Oh, show me the call. And I want to show much more stuff. I've got so much more interest to show, but everything was, hey, call. Oh, you wrote a call, call, call. So I said, you know what? I, I'm going to write a don't have just call. People kept asking me, oh, do you just do call? Is that all you do? It's just, it's just a call. <laughs> and, and that was annoying me to no end. So I was like, okay, I'm going to write a book to change that. Do you still perform that call? And do you do you find people who know about it? Is it different now that if people know you as the call book guy, is that more interesting to you now because Principi has become such a big thing? Right. It, it sort of overshadowed uh, um, close calls, as not it? Uh, people still ask me about a call once, once in a while. Do People still know me for the call. Every time I do a lecture, if I lecture stuff on Principia, people will still ask, oh, by the way, um, I'm disappointed there's no call section. Could you just go run through the call? With you? <laughs> and so every Q&A section, I'm expected to do a mini workshop on because I, I've already removed that since from, you know, I've since removed that section from my lectures because I want to focus on stuff, but people sure. still want to see the old hits. You know, it's like watching the Beatles and then the Beatles do all their new songs or whatever. And go like, no, I want to hear, you know, I want to hold your hand or something like that. You just want to hear the old stuff. Um, so, 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 so that has been the case. And uh, with Principia, this is a story. I don't know if you, I don't think anyone knows this. I've never shared this with anyone. I want, I actually wanted to share this story in my next, which is that a lot of people think that Principia was written in a way like I want to share all my stuff. But what happened was on the way back, this is absolutely true. On the way back from college, I, I studied. Uh, so on the way back to Singapore, after I finished my final exam, I told myself, okay, the moment I reach Singapore, my goal is to write. I have hmm. a title. I'm like, okay, I'm going to write this. So on the plane, I, I took out my uh, notebook and I was like, I'm going to write this, this, this. I was like ticking all the tricks I want. Tick, tick, tick. Mm -hmm. Tick, tick, tick. Good, good, good. You know, and I fell asleep and all that. I went home and I realized I don't have my notebook. I left it on the plane. Oh, no. True story. I, I had a nice big book just like you, a nice big notebook. And I lost it. And that's years and years of stuff, which is why I, I don't use big notebooks. I just use cheap, small notebooks. So that if I lose it, it's not that bad. That's a great tip. I lost the entire book. And that entire book was easily, let me, let me try to think about it. It's at least like six, seven years worth. Of well, actually, that was, that was really my next question. That was what I was going to ask you is how long did it take you to invent everything that you know wanted to put into Principia? Principia was about 10 years of stuff. Wow. It's about 10 years of stuff. So I was so devastated by that. I quickly, and I genuinely quickly grabbed the, the nearest thing to me, which happened to be a piece of cardboard. I still keep it as a moment, a piece of random, like random ass cardboard. And I started <laughs> writing down everything I could remember on that piece of cardboard before I forgot. And I wow. wrote down like about 50 something trick titles I can still remember off the top of my head from what I did on the plane. And that piece of cardboard formed the premise, formed the basis for what pre -KPL is. So I don't know how many tricks I've forgotten by now. Wow. But the book was written almost not out of love, but out of fear, out of fear of forgetting, you know, a big part of my life. And so I, I was so happy when it eventually became a hit because it felt like something that it desperation turned that work. Yeah. yeah. The desperation turned into, you know, uh, recognition and you know validation and of course money so that's sure <laughs> that's good yeah. what, what was the process like you know you you worked with vanishing ink did you reach out mm -hmm. to them did they reach out to you what was that like to find a publisher for the book and and work with them yeah i i was i was very lucky in the sense that um even with close calls and so on uh, I, I i could reach out to them pretty easily and they were always very happy to work with because even before then uh, i already knew of joshua i already knew of andy they were uh, sort of email we were email friends i used to submit a lot of tricks to josh's uh talk column about on, tricks. On, on talk about tricks that's where i got my start I just submitted stuff for free. People knew me from there. Uh, well, a few people who read the magazine would know me. Um, and then from there, when they started their own company, I went, oh, wow, the two people I email most often are now together in a company. So I immediately approached them, say, hey, I want to write a book on the call. They said, yes. So there was close calls. And eventually when I told them, hey, I'm, I'm writing a big book, two thirds of the way through, are you interested in publishing it? They said, yes. And that became Print KPL. So it's always me reaching out to them. That's awesome though, that you had that connection by submitting tricks to to mm. to a magazine for for publication yeah uh, the, the the funny thing is a lot of the, the landscape has changed isn't it i mean if you look at the past in the past mm. people like i don't know paul harris or michael amar or whoever it is in that in that era it used to be right. the era of journals and stuff like there were these big journals coming up yep 
you're probably submitting these tricks. I don't know how much money they're getting or probably zero money they're getting from Harry Lorraine or Richard Kaufman or whoever it is. Um, but nowadays, that era seems to be less. And with the ability to self-publish and sell your own stuff on your own website and all that, every kid just wants to publish and become the next Kalen Morelli or Blake Boyd. And they just want to like, oh, we have the biggest gimmick ever and whatever. And, and it's a very different era. No, no one wants to totally. publish for free nowadays. But I used to publish for free. And um, people, there were people who actually recognized me from those trips on, on the magazine. I got, people, I got one or two people before who were like, oh, I've seen your name. I've never met you before, but I remember in the magazine, I've seen your name. Oh, yeah, you had that thing. And a lot of stuff in close calls were all in the magazine and eventually became. Do, you know. do you have a favorite trick that you've created? I know that's difficult for a lot of creators to identify the one child that they find their favorite, mm -hmm. but curious yeah. if you have one. I, I find that with me, my favorite trick is always the one that is not published yet. It's always the mm. newest one I've made. So um, there, I, I can point out what's my favorite in Principia, so at least some of my favorites. I can point out why some of my favorites in Close Calls. But if you ask me my favorite in general, it would be something that I've just not published because it's what I'm working on. It's what I'm most passionate about. If you want to know right now, uh, I just came up a few weeks ago with an Ace Assembly that I think is pretty legit. It's, Ace Assembly has been a plot I've never been interested in, but uh, I came up with a handling and a version that I think is pretty good. So that's what I'm, I, I'm, I'm, it's my favorite right now. So that kind of leads me into the question, I guess, especially since you said something that interests me. You said you weren't interested in it, but now you found a way. So how did you get working on something that initially, you, you know, you think doesn't interest you? How did you get into uh, ACE assemblies or putting one together based on the fact that you, you didn't like them initially? Sure. So when it comes to ACE assemblies, I, I, I always feel like the problem, okay, let's just talk specifically about ACE assemblies. Mm -hmm. There are other plots that I don't really like, but sure. um, ACE assemblies <laughs> is, was one of them. And I always felt like ACE assemblies, it almost feels like it's just a you're doing a transposition, like four kings and four aces kind of thing. You are spreading them out one by one, right? Like you make one ace disappear first and move, then one right. ace, then one ace. And it feels like you're doing three different packet tricks. Right. It's like, here's but a packet trick. All the, but all the here's same a, thing, really, right? Yeah. After a while, I mean, if you're, if you're doing like McDonald's aces, which is probably the yep, cleanest, the one of the cleanest yeah. ways, then it's like you're doing three packet tricks. It seems redundant. Mm -hmm. And if you're not doing the McDonald's ace, if you're doing a, a sleight of hand version, it's either you've already swapped them out, which means you have to do, uh, you know, weird weird stuff like, like, you know, you have to do things like where you've already swapped out an ace and then you have to do like, okay, uh, I take the final, I take the first ace and, you know, oh, and you're just finding like, how many ways are there to vanish a card? Let's do a rubber duck. Let's do right. a, you know, <laughs> whatever. Right? It, it, it's just like, mm. And then if you say like, oh, Harpan, I don't switch out the aces in their packets, then you have to do some weird ass like transfer. Like, okay, let's do a burden transfer <laughs> at the right. worst moment possible right. when everyone is staring they're burning, at you. They're burning it, yeah. Correct, so you have to do a Elmsley count and then you have to transfer the ace to the second packet, you know, some Larry Jennings, Vernon, Servon switch yeah. or something like that. And it's like, I, I, so it always felt like a very redundant thing. And I right. used to really like ace assemblies the instant, which mm -hmm. means uh, the old school ace assembly. It's not the slow motion version where you go to one by one. Yeah. No, just but, put like, the, aces but down. like the John Ooh. Bannon ones where the timing was off a little bit in his right. uh, Dear Mr. Fantasy. Yeah. 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 But and those, yeah, and those, those instant kinds. Yeah. yeah. I used yeah. to really love instant Ace of Sam's. Um, can't remember what really instigated it, but I decided recently when I was in a creative slum to work on something that I really hate. That's something I used to tell people that if you are stuck on something, you think about what you hate, you really think about why you hate it, and you say like, okay, if that's why I hate it, then let's not do that thing. Maybe you will learn to love it. And, and, and I did it with that. And um, Interesting. The, the, the plot I said to come up with was, uh, to, to work on was, uh, what is traditionally known as O. Henry Aces. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, because of Darwin Ortiz, most people know it as Hitchcock Ace. The idea is that uh, the Aces one by one travel, and the last one, the Aces appear in the spectator's packet. So you, your packet is suddenly no Aces, and it's all in their hand. Sure. And um, I noticed that all the slide of hand versions, again, you have to do some weird ass, like load and transfer. You have to pick up the deck suddenly. Why? Because you have to switch out some cards. <laughs> Because I have to do something. <laughs> yeah, correct, correct. So I wanted a version that I had no uh, deck. It turns out Simon Aronson already had a solution, but I have my own that I think has, uh, benefits, you know, pros and cons compared to Aronson's version. So I'm pretty happy with my version. I'm still working on it, but that's my favorite. Do you think you'll release it at some point? 
eventually in my next book probably in my in my, in my in my future book yeah sure we'll look forward to seeing that you, you mentioned a lot of names there that you mentioned a lot of names that real that that i like a lot uh michael lamar and paul harris and simon yeah. aronson and some of these others i, I name drop these people to make me feel look more learned more like, <laughs> more, more, <laughs> more erudite more erudite yeah right? exactly more erudite. oh I, I, i've read ben and uh, solomon and same same Brennan, i just so i throw Jennings. people's names out you know <laughs> well who who does inspire you so when you like to read who, who are some of your favorite creators that that you like to read? wow um it, it sounds like a cliche answer but honestly a lot of many people uh, inspire me in different ways different ways um i think that the, the 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 people that most people agree are masters are generally very inspired uh, I'll, I'll just name a few off the top of my head i like elmsley mm -hmm. i like walton i like john bannon david solomon uh peter duffy peter duffy has some great stuff not many people know his, his self-working stuff and stuff is so well constructed and peter duffy of course came from the walton sort of school yeah so that that makes sense um the japanese people there are some great japanese some of my friends the younger people is so talented as well very clever um joshua j used to be a huge inspiration for me uh andy gladwin and all this yeah so th so there really is a big bunch of magicians there that uh really really inspire me with their work when i read it. jay sankey has some great stuff as well really oh yeah oh he's got a ton of stuff too jay sankey has good has this knack of when he's good he can take like the weirdest idea and make it into a really practical jay sankey nowadays uh, yeah it's, a, it's like a hit and miss i mean he's doing a lot of his youtube stuff as well and he's doing sure. quite well over there um but if you look at his old stuff it's just the most oh, yeah. creative thing ever nowadays he's a bit of mo he's a bit more hit and miss like he's sure. got some really great stuff that go maybe you know that blows my mind and there's some stuff that but you know the, everyone's a hit everyone's a hit in this everyone's a hit. yeah the the definitive sankey i i know that josh and andy i talked mm -hmm. in fact i interviewed andy on this channel we uh -huh. talked about it that he's going to republish it i highly recommend those to people it's just to, to get there's so much that stuff. He's done yeah so much there's stuff. so much stuff there's so much stuff you know even if you were to be very cynical about it and say that oh everything is sturgeon's law that 90 percent of everything is crap you take the definitive sankey okay you throw away 90 percent. that 10 percent <laughs> is like 20 tricks you're getting 20 amazing tricks you know it's, sure. it's great exactly yeah. do you do you have a favorite uh magic book that's not yours i mean obviously i'm assuming that one of yours would be one of your favorites but if it <laughs> but if it but if you had to choose a book that wasn't yours do you have a favorite book that's not yours? uh one of my favorite books let me think yeah yeah i, I mean like, like once again there are many different books that appeal to me for very different reasons i mean if it's all about theory i like the ascanio volume one right the structural conception i found myself reading that book every time i read it um i find myself nodding my head in agreement because it's always things that i felt were it's like yes this is exactly why they put it nice words like yes it's beautiful uh, when i was younger and thinking i was going to be a professional magician there was a time where i thought i was going to do that i like uh, maximum entertainment which is again another non -magic Ken Webber. magic yeah. book yeah non magic magic book otherwise um i used to do this series called fully book vanishing ink where i would do book reviews for them yeah. and, and i, I, did I read several well. of them yeah. yeah i did on instagram and a lot of those books that i used to review are all my so for example i was just looking through this book recently just rereading it collectibles of alex elmsley boom one of my favorites one of my favorites elmsley is always a very clever very very clever guy um yeah but 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 people like i said the encyclopedia of card magic oh great old school one yeah I just yeah. talked about some I, of those yeah you know until now i've not met a single, a single person who has read every trick even now i think i've read it so many times i still pick it up i'll still see something i've forgotten about or i've just well, missed it on those, my read yeah and those old books were so dense too so you had you know a write-up that big and yeah. they packed so much into that and then they were on Correct. to the next thing so there's just so many right. so many things in it whereas modern books they pad it up like one trick takes 20 pages because 18 pages are just big color photo photos exactly uh, photos and 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 of course it's very beautiful but i go like i don't know if that's needed yeah. that's what that's what i do with Princapia. i just condense every 60 tricks fit in that because everything was small I, i'm not sure i need big photographs it looks very beautiful and i've well, got some I, books that do that but i don't know and i'm a fan of the old school illustrations too it's just mm. something about those uh that old school way of picking up a book and there's somebody who's drawn the hands doing mm. with the cards and that's just right. cool that's just cool in an old school way you you know right with print paper it's not a drawing it's a it's actually a photograph no way the, 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 the black and white things are actually photographs so um my friend thomas uh, blomberg from sweden he did the same thing with his book blomberg laboratories which is that he has this photoshop uh action file like an algorithm basically you take a photo you pop it into photoshop you click one button and it becomes that drawing. that's so, incredible so you, there, there, there are some um, constraints like you need you need to have a green screen behind you sure and the sure. picture must have something red in it. so you need to put a red bicycle 
card. Like either you're using a red deck or if you're using a blue deck, you just need a red card on the table somehow or somewhere. But once you click it, the, the Photoshop will like automatically detect the red, detect the green, and erase the colors. And blah, 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 blah. Thomas is, is is really genius, and if you look at his book, it, it's some of the most creative, you know, very unique ideas. When you're when you when people read your book. I'm curious, what do you hope they take away? What I hope they take away uh, from my books are always ideas. I don't expect people to perform my tricks the exact same way that I do because I want to do this. I want them to do the same thing that I do, which is that when I read other people's books, um, of course, there are some tricks that are so good that I don't mind just taking it wholesale and putting it in my repertoire. But then again, I will definitely change something like, for example, how I present it, um, how I would do certain things or... Uh, I'll just take one aspect of that trick that I like and say like, oh, I wouldn't do it with this ending. What if I like change that about that? Sure. And, and I hope everyone who reads my books, like this is Principia or Stylo or Four Treasures or whatever book I've released, um, don't see my trick as just a fat thing that, oh, I can't change this anymore. Always learn to like, oh, I like this part, but I didn't like that. And feel free to change it. And when, when you publish your trick, just credit me that that was the inspiration. But then feel free to publish your version of the trick. And I'm very happy when I see people on Instagram or whatever do, do that kind of thing. How does process work? Because I know you like to come up with something. And then I, I understand from both in Principia and then I've seen you you on social media, you like to perform it out there and get some feedback, it seems like, on social media. Or how does your creative hmm. process work in that? Oh, uh, you mean in terms of getting feedback through performance and stuff? Yeah, so I've seen you put, perform pieces that I think you're, you haven't written up, but you're performing um, them maybe to see uh, what what people's thoughts are yeah. or what you know yeah. things like that. Sure. Honestly, very honestly, I think what happens with this sort of thing is that um, because I'm, I'm, I'm hardly a performer, even though I don't think I'm necessarily a bad performer, but I just don't perform as, you know, I don't have the experience as much as most magicians. Um, when I come up with a trick and I want some feedback, I will show my friends, my family first in real life, much more so than on social media. I think social media as a feedback platform uh, is limited. It's very limited because most people on social media will only say nice things. I mean, in person, yeah, in person, they will say nice things as well. But if you are jamming with people, you're sessioning with people, and there are people who trust, they will say, oh, I thought that was a bit clumsy or that was a bit flash. And that's very important to just one or two or three people who are willing to give that sort of feedback to each other. In that awesome. On social media, everyone's just like, what? Mind blown. <laughs> you know, oh, 100, 100, 100, 100. You know, like, oh, yeah, this is little killer, hurt, hurt, fire, hurt, hurt, hurt. Yeah, right, fire, right. fire. You know, like, yeah, it's, it's always like that. So I, I'm not sure about social media as a feedback form. I've never really seen it that way, to be honest. Um, I used to just post on Instagram because I was having this goal that I wanted. Not every day, just every Sunday, I would post something. Recently, I've stopped because I needed to detox social media. But <laughs> I, I, I used to do this every Sunday. And so eventually, I would run out of stuff. And I would go, okay, I guess I'll just take one of my newer tricks. All right, let's, let's just do that. You know, nice, sure, and uh, and then of course to to generate traffic and to generate comments, I will always say like, oh, what do you think? Comment below, and right. that would get yeah. some comments. Of, yeah, of so course. so to to be very honest, social media is a little bit on if I if I put it bluntly, to be on the fake side where sure it is actually I'm just performing. I don't I don't really expect too much feedback because most of the feedback I get is just heart shape, heart shape, fire, fire, sure. fire. It's like okay, I'm I'm, I'm glad, but, but, but but I'm also grateful for that. I'm not saying that what they do. I'm right. grateful for that feed for that for that engagement because that's what social media is about. No, I understand that completely. You mentioned earlier about performing for family and friends. Who's your typical audience when you perform and, and how often do you get to perform? Well, whoever's around me, whoever is unlucky enough to be around me, you know, it's all, <laughs> it's not a, I mean, nowadays I'm, I just moved in with my wife like last year. So now my wife always gets first glance. Uh, otherwise it's my friends on, I'll send them a message on WhatsApp or Telegram, whatever it may be. Send them a quick video. Um, if I think it's really good, there might be some magic forums, some private magic forums that will post it on. People can give me feedback on there. Um, yeah, I think I think those are my main audience members. Maybe my siblings as well. Yeah, nice. I, I very rarely perform for my colleagues at, at work because everyone's being very professional. Sure. And uh, teachers are very hard to perform for. Yeah, I don't know if you know if you if you know why teachers. Um, you know there are these occupational hazards for every job. So if you are a, a minor, maybe you have a lung problem. Uh, if you are a I don't know a carpenter, maybe you breathe in all the dust and cut your mm -hmm. fingers or something like that. The teacher's occupational hazard is that they get really uncomfortable when they are put in a position where they don't know something mm. because they're always expected to know everything, right? When a student asks you a question, you're supposed to, oh, oh, right. Newton's law say that, blah, blah, blah. You, you cannot say, I don't know. If you say you don't know means you're a bad. Untrue, 
but a lot of teachers have this opinion have this opinion which I, of course is that's very students interesting actually, i never would have students, considered that students always students will actually respect you if you say oh i don't know i'm just going to check it out like yeah okay most students right. wouldn't even consider anything but a lot of teachers get worried that if i say oh i don't know you're a bad sir, right you don't know your <laughs> stuff so anyway so whenever you perform for teachers you find that they're very eager to like oh it's like oh it's fast hands isn't it oh yeah they're just trying to constantly is that they're, they're constantly heckling you because they're so <laughs> uncomfortable being in a position that they don't know they have to try to figure it out so uh yeah so i i, I rarely perform for teachers. that, that actually is a great piece of advice i never would have considered whatsoever so that's fantastic that's what i found that's what i found what does your uh what does your personal library look like do you keep a lot of books or do you read books and get rid of them it sounds like you you obviously have read a lot uh, mm. I'm just curious if you're a collector or if you kind of read and move on or how you how you process. Oh uh, no no no! When I when I buy the books because I've spent so much money and I, I will keep them. I, I I don't think I've really sold many books in my life in my library. They they're all with me. Uh, I can't show it to you right now because they're in the no, living room. No, that's okay. Room. I, I, that's I've okay. got a big I've got a big shelf in my living room. Um, but I keep all the books that I bought except for maybe one or two extra copies where I'm selling it off. I made and a mistake. I, I made mm -hmm. a mistake early on. I bought a couple books from. Kaufman and Company and right. uh, Derek Dingle's book, Brother John Hammond, and uh, wow. I think the new Jinx. And I ended up selling Brother John Hammond and Derek Dingle at one point because I didn't think I was going to do that stuff. And then I right. really regretted it. So I, I finally got a copy of Brother John Hammond back, but I still don't have the Dingle. Is it a yellow book at the back? I, yes. I see something. Yes. A yes. Big yellow book. Yep. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. That's. I wanted to do. I, I made, you know, when Vanishing Ink first. The thing is, the color of printing paper was chosen by Vanishing. Ah. They just suddenly said, hey, what about an orange book? What an orange book. And I went, oh, that's a weird color because I want the printing paper <laughs> to be, you know, like an old school book, right? It's supposed to be dark green or black or blue with gold foil and all that. You know, like an old school 1600 tone. That's awesome. But so it's orange. I go, oh, but I just, I just sort of didn't comment on it. I just continued with it. And it became a really unique thing. Because whenever now I look at someone's shelf, oh, it's just this big giant orange thing. And I go like, that's my book. Otherwise, it just blends in, right? If it's red or black or green, it just blends in with every other. Orange is such a stick out. So it's that's such right. an obvious color. Yeah. And if people don't have it, if you hold the book, you'll never forget holding it either because it's not... It's a hardbound, but yes, there's some it's sort squishy. of uh, padding on it's it. Squishy. So it's, yeah. it, it, it holds different even than any other book that you've held. So it's very... It's it's very squishy, yes. Yeah, it's very, I remember very... when I first took it out also, I didn't know it was squishy until I <laughs> held it. They didn't tell me it was going to be squishy. So I was like, oh, expecting this, like this hard back, you know, like mm, <laughs> from the 1600s, unearthed from Newton's uh, own personal collection. And I took it out like, wait, wait, wait what the... <laughs> <laughs> I messaged Andy. I didn't know the book was squishy. And he was like, yeah, I want... I want wanted to do a squishy book so i thought i would do it with yours <laughs> okay i guess it's a squishy book now but but it's great it's great people people seem to love it so, so that's and then like and then the, well. the boy who cried get magic it's a bespoke uh mm -hmm. you know slip cover right you know <laughs> yeah. yeah that's what i thought my book was going to be that's what i thought was going to be like this but no but but honestly I, I don't know if i'm going to be exposing anything i don't think andy would mind me seeing this but what i understand from them is that kpr really was a breakthrough product for the company because um before that they were publishing books and stuff like that but i think Principia really showed them that with the proper marketing on social media and you push it correctly and you make it a luxurious product you know it comes with gimmick card it yeah. comes with videos and all that people really respond very well to books to the point where you know it made a lot of money so yeah, but i think it's almost become like a template for how they produce books like if you notice they really push the marketing they really go with the uh, uh what was i going to say they really go with the uh gimmick cards and mm -hmm. videos yeah. and all that it includes everything correct they, they, they really go for that nowadays they what they realize that's what books have become a luxury item for sure with the videos yeah. that that brings up an interesting point was that your idea and what made you if it was what what made you consider that it would be a good idea to pair you know, videos with the written. Um, I think because it's easier to see exactly what a performer is requiring from you from a video, right? I, I, I even though I love magic books and I always recommend people to read more magic. Mm -hmm. I'm not of the opinion that um, you know, some magicians, some magic book aficionados would probably say something like, "All good magic is only in books. Forget about videos. Forget about downloads. Forget about gimmicks. Just read book." I think that's silly because obviously, good magic can be found everywhere. Just like bad magic can be found found everywhere. The, the <laughs> medium that the magic is published in has no bearing on its quality. You're going to find great magic everywhere and bad magic everywhere. Mm -hmm. But uh, with videos, I think if I have, if I see a complete beginner who's never really bought my, read any books and they ask me, oh, Harapan, what book should I buy or what should I read? And I, and I look at their skill level and it's really, really on the low end. They can barely do a double undercut. 
I wouldn't recommend them to read Royal Road, right? Uh, which, which is controversial because a lot of people will say, oh, Royal Road is the only way to go. Screw everything, you know, go and read Royal Road. But it's really hard for them. You know, as a beginner, I remember when I was young, it's really hard for me to understand what a book is trying to explain if you don't know how to hold a deck of cards properly. And so I would rather them say, hey, you know what? Have you heard of L&L &L DVDs? You know, you go and check out some downloads like Michael MR, Easy to Master Card Miracles, or just one of those videos. Or just yeah. honestly, nowadays on YouTube, there are a lot of great beginner tutorials that are free, but, but they are done by amazing magicians. I mean, a Jay Sankey or a Alex Pandrea or something, that simple stuff, or how to do a fan, how to do a double lift or something like that. Just to get them started on understanding like, oh, this is what it's supposed to look like. I can right. imitate that. Then eventually they will realize very uh, after a few years or maybe one or two years that that well dries up very quickly. They go like, man, I can do all these like color changes and stuff, but every time I see Danny Dawatis do something, I right. am mind blown. And wait, who's that Leonard Green guy? Like what? And I saw this guy, like they mentioned like Alex Elmsley, like who's that? Then you come in and say, oh, if you want to look at that, here, here's a book. And they go like, oh, okay, I guess this is the next level now that I have to go in further. And if they don't want to, then I guess that's the end of their magic journey because that's how right. you progress. But I rarely recommend um, books for very uh, beginner magicians. And that's why I put videos in my, because I realized that um, many people who would buy my book probably are from social media, from Instagram. And many people do message me, Harpan, I've never bought a book before. Your book is the first book I bought. Wow. Um, I only learned from YouTube and I just bought my first book. It's not a beginner's book. So it's, right. it's better if there's a video to help them at least understand what's going on. Otherwise, it's very, very... That's awesome. I, I actually did a video on uh, this subject to talk about the, exactly what you just said, that you start with watching a video, you pair it, you, you do exactly what you see. And then mm. my premise was exactly yours. Eventually you get to a point where you'll want to go to books because you'll get tired of parroting and just being someone else. You want to become who you're intended to be as a, as a performer. So Absolutely. Everyone starts by copying and there's nothing wrong with that. Copying is a great way to learn. Uh, but I always remember that. Eugene mm -hmm. Berger saying that he could imitate Don Allen perfectly. And when you think about people who made their own voice in magic, literally and figuratively, <laughs> Eugene Berger has his own complete character. And yet he started out by completely imitating someone else. When I was like 16 or 16, I was really into Joshua J stuff. And I used to do a pretty good impression of Joshua J. Now, in, in a sense that when I performed, when I created tricks, it was all with this Joshua J tinge and wonderful, take this card. All right, you know, <laughs> hi, I'm Joshua J and you know, look at me. And uh, yeah, it, 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 did not, it did not go down well with my friends. They thought I was, not, not that before that they didn't think I became even more of a weird after that. But, but, but eventually like, you know, I don't know if I'm unique anymore or you know, if I have a unique performing style. Um, I think I'm finding my voice and recognize me for certain things, how I perform and stuff. I put in a lot more comedy when I perform, which is not, some, which is not something Josh likes. Josh doesn't, uh, I think he's mentioned before, he doesn't really like comedy. Which is Very, fine. Yeah, he likes well, to I put in more, I put in more comedy. And, sure. Yep, yeah, correct. I, yeah, and occasionally they watch the channel. So if Josh or Andy are watching, I'm putting in my vote right now to have Harapan come to Magi Fest and imitate Josh for one of the uh, oh segments no, and then nah. do a lecture. That would be great. <laughs> no, no, I, I'll never do that. I'll, I'll imitate other people. I imitate like what Darwin or yeah. That's exactly. <laughs> I'm so gonna what, be, I'm not going to be primarily concerned with losing the aces deck. I'm going to be primarily positioning those aces so that when I deal, I will get those aces. <laughs> you know, in the time I learned. This, I could have become a doctor or a lawyer <laughs> and made my mom much happier. Four aces at the end. And now those are like, so thank you. Thank you. So what is next for you? You mentioned, I emailed you to talk about this, this interview and you mentioned a book that you're writing and would you mind telling uh, maybe my viewers a little bit about what's coming next for you and when maybe that's coming? Yeah. So um, a few years ago, I think just before the pandemic in 2019, I wrote a book called To Your Credit, which is a free ebook, free PDF, uh, which helps people credit stuff because I see so many magicians not understanding how to credit, why they should credit, uh, what to credit, how do you go about finding, you know, doing research for crediting and all that. And that, of course, results in a lot of uh, fighting amongst magicians mm -hmm. where someone will release something and then they'll say like, oh, wait, you stole my stuff. They say, oh, no, 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 it's my independent invention. Simultaneous creation. Or, or, or whatever it is. And um, I, I was just sick and tired of like every few months, even nowadays it still happens, but you know, every few months you'll hear something pop up about, you know, like, oh, this guy copied this guy and this guy copied. So I wanted to write an ebook that's completely free. Anyone can download it and it lays out what I think are the important rules and guidelines for, for crediting. So that one was 
uh, was a good hit. It's been translated into a few languages as well. Uh, I think in Chinese and maybe Japanese. I think Chinese and Japanese, I think. Um, but I wanted to write a new ebook that's also free on the tentative title is something like How to Read a Magic, something awesome. like that. Uh, so it covers like the why should you read books, how you should read books, what are some habits and stuff like that. But then now, uh, genuinely, coincidentally, you message, you emailed me about this interview and you tell me that you have an entire dedicated YouTube channel to the book I'm writing. Do not dedicate to the topic I'm writing about. I'm getting, I'm getting a bit worried. So Jeff, is it okay if I continue <laughs> writing the book? Yeah, absolutely. I can promise you that whatever I've written so far, I did not copy from you. It's all my own idea. So if there's any overlap, this is a genuine case of independent, <laughs> simultaneous creation. It genuinely is my own thoughts and putting it in. I love it. Uh, I love it. Is, so I actually look okay? forward to seeing it. I, I look forward to seeing it because anybody yeah. That, yeah. that is going to help promote the world of magic books and and help people get into what I find to be incredibly rewarding to mine through books, to find the hidden gems for yourself and what appeals to your personality and your persona you know, as you're performing what works in your hands and mixing and matching things. You know, all of that, I think, comes with uh, reading a great book. There's a great quote. I don't know if you've seen it by Jamie Ian Swiss in his mm -hmm. review of uh, the, mat the Card Magic of Nick Trost, one of my favorite books. Uh, yeah, and, um, book. like and at the end of his review, he talks about books being like uh, good friends that you want to visit with them once in a while. So, you know, put your feet up, sit by the fire and enjoy mm -hmm. the company of a good mm -hmm. friend. And that's the way I feel about magic. Yep, it, it, it totally is. Um, magic books have been a great source of joy for me. It's something that I can carry with me every single day. I pick up a book on my shelf. I go out when I commute to work, I'm reading something. When I'm bored, I flip through something. And nowadays it's almost like, a, it's, it's just a great thing. It's like a source of energy and you know, creativity. Just spark totally. something in me every time I read something nowadays that gets me excited. I'm always excited when I get a new book in my hands to crack open and read. It's, it's just great. It brings me so much joy. Yeah. So I, I have to ask just because I do it. Do you smell the books? Uh, no, actually, no. Unless there's a very obvious pungent smell. But in general, no, I do not pick up. I, I love the smell no. of I love the smell of ink on different papers. So I, right. I know I'm strange for doing it, but that's what I do. So I, 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 I mean, I know some I, I know some card guys, some card collectors that smell the deck on the, the moment mm -hmm. they open it, they smell it. But I don't unless it's a very that's a very obvious pungent smell like it's very sure. old I'm, i might like go oh what what's that what's going on but in general <laughs> uh, i just read it <laughs> just read a book yeah. yeah yeah when will this new book be out uh i have no idea it's i'm still writing it i'm probably only about one quarter of the way or maybe even less than that I just literally started a few days ago during the awesome. holidays, like on Saturday, I started writing it. So uh, then you I look forward me. to hearing about it. They, they, they email me, right? So it's, it's so coincidental. Right. Um, yeah. So when, when, when it eventually comes out, uh, yeah, you, you'll, you'll definitely get it. Download a copy. Have Perfect. a look at it. Love to. It's, it's a, it really just a love letter. It's, it's called How to Read a Magic Book, but it's really not just how and why, who you should read, which books, how do you select, what books, how, why, and blah, blah, blah. All these different question asked sure, sure. about magic book. So any final thoughts for my viewers? about uh, magic books or really about anything in magic but uh, any final words for my viewers? Um, I, th I think if you're subscribed to Erudite Magic, you probably already love magic books. So I don't think I have to continue telling you all about how much you know you should read books. I would say that uh, con always continue to learn more and more regardless of the medium, whether it's books, videos, or DVDs. And when you take these books, don't necessarily see them just as instruction manuals for how you're supposed to perform that trick. Uh, see them as, like I said, a source of inspiration and creativity, further your own magic by taking elements from all these different masters and boosting what you already do. I think that's the most important thing you can get out of a book. Sometimes when you watch, a, the, the, the reason why I like books over videos is that for videos, sometimes you have to scroll through the entire thing just to see how the trick is done. With books, sometimes I, nowadays I feel like I can just read one sentence or even like one phrase, just three words, and suddenly something clicks in my brain. I don't know if you've ever had that experience before. Oh, for sure. I would just go like, I'm, I'm, I'm on a train, right? Back, back home from work. And I'll open a book, a random book. The magician takes four aces. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. And suddenly it's not even the same trick. It's just something about taking four aces. And I go, you know what? The aces. And I take out my deck of cards. And that's the rest of the train trip. Yeah. I read three books and I come out with the best trick ever. And I feel like this book has inspired me. It's not even the same trick. Maybe it's some lame ass, like twisting the aces thingy, whatever. And then suddenly I'm doing an ace assembly. It doesn't matter. Right. It's just that, that those few words have inspired me completely. And I think that inspiration, I've never had that experience with. I've only, oh, very rarely with videos, mostly right. with books. No, I so completely I agree. This, the power of the word, of the printed word is so, it's so inexplicable. I, I really hope 
all your readers understand that books are not an instruction manual. It's a source of magic, magical inspiration. Well said. Well said, sir. Okay, Erudite Magic, thanks for watching. And until then, keep reading.